Now, the, the other critical process part of this uh, learning, this, this key steps to, to learning expertise uh, is, okay, hard, hard, challenging problems, explicit expert-like thinking, but then there also has to be a process of feedback and reflection, both reflection by the learner as to, you know, have they gone through this, what they got right and wrong, and how they can, you know, do better, how they can learn better, and then feedback uh, from the expert teacher or coach to guide their thinking and again provide feedback. But I want to emphasize the guiding of thinking. You know, when you're talking about back to the wrap-up issue, really want to be thinking about how the people are thinking, what's right, what's wrong, how you provide useful guidance to point them in the right direction, how how to provide useful guidance to learn further. Okay, so this whole this whole process here is, um, as it's sort of generically applied to all expertise, uh, has been labeled in the popular psychology terms as deliberate practice. So if I use that term, uh, and so basically you just you know it's pretty straightforward. Now you go and you take these. You want to learn something, you take this process, you get a set of tasks going through this. Uh, you do it at about 10,000 hours, seems to be a pretty standard number for almost everybody, um, of getting harder and harder tasks as you get better and better. And, and uh, 10,000 hours of that, you have a very different brain with a uh, high level, sort of world class level of expertise. And, I, I emphasize this about changing the brain. Um, it, it's becoming clear that really much, it's a much more accurate analogy than people used to think of between the brain and a muscle that you know, I, if I want to develop a muscle, I use it very strenuously and I do that over and over again. The body responds by saying, oh, I got to build that muscle up. It's good. It does really the same thing with the brain. So that's why uh, you know, it is quite analogous. If you want to use the brain in the way you want it to get good, and you want to use it very strenuously in a long period of time. Um, and so this is sort of this requiring the right kind of brain exercise. And the effective teacher is really, the, you know, should be thought of as a kind of cognitive coach that develops the right exercise, encourages and supports this intense brain exercise by the students. Um, okay, now I'm going to say the thing that's most controversial and can distract from the entire rest of the talk, so I'm just going to tell you what the research tells and says, and try not to let this distract you from the rest of the talk, and we'll come back and talk about it later. But the, um, so what the research also says is that any measures of need ability or talent actually play a very small part as long as you're dealing with a broad, you know, not the tails of the human population, or disabilities, etc. They actually play a, uh, quite a small part in this process and it's much more dominated by the actual time spent on deliberate practice than any initial conditions that people have been able to establish for the brain. Now, although this what is true, is that the beliefs about the importance of innate talent or whether certain people have or don't have it, beliefs of the teachers or the students, those have profound effects. Those are also, you know, there's not, those are just opinions without any support. When you try to measure things, you don't see anything. Uh, so, so you can certainly affect these things but there's actual, the fundamental limitations don't really seem to be inherent here. Okay, so so that's sort of a, a big picture. Now let me get down to physics. How do you how do you apply this in the classroom? Well, th these are things you've already all seen. So I just wanted to give an example of a, you know a teaching practice we've all seen gets better results and couple this back to this. And so this would be you know teaching E and M basic electricity and current with peer instruction, for example, where you've got, um, you know, so I'm going to zip through the, the 
description here, you know, some pre-class reading assignment, you tested on that, you come into class and instead of sitting listening to lectures, you have things like concept questions, you know, that of you have seen this, and you have peer instruction, you <laughs> clickers where you, you know, the individual student will answer, and then you'll have uh, the consensus group discussions and the professor listen in, and then you'll have the, the wrap up with student reasoning and responses and do an experiment. And so, um, okay, so now I'm gonna just go back and connect this up with all these general practice of development of expertise and show that yes, this technique works, can be understood why it works by looking at, at how it's actually supported these ideas of development of expertise. Uh, I'll actually, uh, before I get into that, uh, I want to just make a point here. This is something where you can understand why the individual first answering the individual with clicker and why you should never have your clickers be anonymous. This is basic psychology research that if a person has to commit to an answer that they're accountable for and hear you know, whether you rate it or not, computer knows, so the instructor knows, that means they have at some level of accountability. A person will think completely differently about that question than if I just throw it out and say, think about such and such. And what the psychology research shows, it will actually greatly prime them for subsequent learning. Be, they'll, they'll not only be much better prepared from the thinking they've done, they'll want to know the answer much better. So this is just a way you can use broader research but I want to get back to, to the, this whole process. So how are they practicing like the, the physicists in there? How are they getting the necessary feedback that acquisition of expertise would say they're going to have? Well, so if you think about you know, those kind of questions, and again, this, this is a good guide for what kind of concept questions you want to be giving students. Um, that question with the light bulb, that, really probes directly at what a person's basic conceptual model is for electric current flow and how it would apply in certain situations. And so it's very much uh, having them to, to test and apply and modify their conceptual model of electricity. That's a very fundamental aspect of expertise. They're practicing testing their reasoning, this idea of self-checking. Uh, they're doing that by through their discussions with other students, where they're examining other students' arguments, other students are critiquing theirs, they're trying to present them, they're comparing you know, what they predicted with what's going to be shown in the experiment, etc. And so, so there's very much explicitly practicing of this, reflecting on and testing their reasoning, and they're getting multiple forms of, of feedback to, to refine and guide their thinking. And this is, in some ways, this is maybe the biggest change and probably the most important aspect um, of a lot of these active engagement techniques here. And you know, if, you, if you think about that, um, we go through all the different forms of feedback. So first, um, research on effect. Very timely, right there. What you're thinking about, it's got to really address your thinking. A generic, uh, no, that's wrong or that's right, really doesn't allow one to guide one's thinking at all. Especially if it comes two weeks later when the assignment's created. Um, and so, but here, so you think of all the different ways that's happening. So the the, the first way is that. Um, in the student-student discussions, they're getting feedback from their fellow students. Uh, in the wrap-up and the, and the broader discussion that the instructor would be leading, uh, this, a good instructor has gone right there, and is just talking about listening in to all of these discussions, and therefore can get much more targeted, understands what the thinking of the students is, can be much more targeted, can really go over the things where People are, are thinking incorrectly, or I mean, oftentimes it's not even incorrect. It's just it's just misunderstanding terminology or application and so on. 
but it, that's enormously helpful then to guide uh, somebody to improve. And then, and then finally, of course, they have a comparison about what they predicted, seeing what happens in the experiment or the simulation. And all that's happening in a sort of 10 minute uh, period. So that's enormously more productive. So basically, uh, you know, that's the idea. So now you can see, okay, what we do and, then, and what people have seen as effective physics education techniques really match with this basic ideas of expertise. So if you want to go and try something new, what you can do is you've got a set of principles and you see, okay, so how well are they going to match what we know is important for all learning. You're not just flying blind. And in particular, if you want to go and say, well, I know how to do something in introductory physics because that's all written down. I want to try something in an engineer senior level physics course that I don't have anything about. These provide very useful guidance and in fact, go beyond physics. And, and so in these broader initiatives I've been leading, we've seen this work very well. We have, we have across the sciences, across the levels, people are putting in place teaching methods. Many of them look much the same, just adjusted to the right level, adjusted to thinking about what really is the expertise you want the students to acquire at that level. And it works pretty well now. Uh, I, I should say there's, uh, just in terms of instructors and what they're doing, uh, in this kind of teaching, there's lots of instructor talking in a class that designed this way, but the really the effective talking is in the reactive mode, not just transmitting information. You can shift that outside the classroom. It doesn't have to be. If the instructor's a talking textbook, that's wasting resources. Uh, it does, and I'll come back to this, it does require much more subject expertise. For those of you who have ever done this in a really highly interactive, engaged classroom, know that the, the number and the depth of questions you'll get from students and really probing the deep uh, issues are dramatically higher. And by the way, from the perspective of working with new faculty, um, so I'm not digressing a little bit again, but we, we have to real, we realize it's really critical to prepare, uh, especially young faculty, for that aspect of it, that they will be getting questions they cannot answer. I get questions all the time I cannot answer, and that you have to be prepared to handle that rather than try and be able to make sense. Okay, um, so let me go ahead and back this up with a little bit of research, uh, and I'll do some sampling to find out how much I'm just repeating things you know and pop over and don't do. But um, I, I want to make sure that all of you know about this recent uh, National Research Council uh, report on discipline based uh, education research uh, that reviews the basic status of this across a number of different science uh, disciplines. How many, can you raise your hand if you're familiar with this before? Okay, so not many are. Okay, good. So you learn something important here. So this is, you know, one of these, one of these National Academy committees comes together, pulls together all the research, summarizes the state of the field, what we know, what we don't know, uh, etc. And of course, physics is sort of leading in this dominant, but uh, it's worthwhile for all of um, okay, so the first area of research uh, we want to talk about a little is, again, as I emphasize this as a component of expertise, is um, conceptual mastery. And what, what I mean by that, and again, this is a good way to think about assessment, is given a new context, can the students take and apply correctly uh, to solve problems these concepts that you that's what experts do, that's what you want to test to be done, and that's where physics education research is really led in measuring um, what works and what doesn't work and how to do this. So